everyone. Welcome back to our Ask the Vet video series with SmartPak staff veterinarian and medical director, Dr. Lydia Gray. Uh, I'm excited to have Lydia back. We had a bonus episode with Dr. Andy Kanos. That was who very cool. was fantastic, yeah. but I did miss you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you know, nice. I mean, I feel like we have a, you know, we got the we got the jokes going. Yeah. Because we've, we've yeah. been doing Although this for a little funny. while. He is very funny. He's funny. But he didn't want to, he didn't want to give any of those jokes. He's he, a little bit serious. Yeah, he kept that, he kept that just for, just for the Smart Packers. So I want to go over some ground rules for you guys. As you know, we're here to answer horse health questions submitted by you and voted on by fans like you. And if your question gets picked, you get a Smart Pack gift card, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. If you've had a question answered in this video or earlier videos and you haven't gotten your gift card, just email us at customercare at smartpack.com. We'll take care of you. We will absolutely hook you up. Our team is always happy to help. And uh, we did answer some questions from way back in the archives in Dr. Canup's video. Very so fun. check that one out. Subscribe so you don't miss it when it comes out. You might be a winner. You might be a winner. And that's the best way to find out is to see your question answered. And last but not least, if you've asked a question and we haven't put it up for voting, it might be because we've answered something really similar in the past. Good and we want to answer point. as much variety as we can. Yeah. So always check out our archives. We break out every uh, question on our website as well. So you can have just the question, just the answer to the question you're looking for. You don't have to watch the whole episode. Although, Although I don't can. know why you wouldn't want to <laughs> because we're very, very entertaining. And without further ado, we're gonna jump right into question <laughs> okay. one. Now that I've set us up to be the most entertaining oh, duo. Oh goodness, the pressure. Jumper Lou on YouTube is wondering, I have a horse that was diagnosed with anhydrosis. Aside from medication, is there anything I can do to help him? I once saw a horse like that at a barn I was at before, and since medication wouldn't help him much, the owner decided to start giving him half a beer every morning to help him sweat. Apparently it worked, but is that a good idea? What do you um, think? Can I answer the first part? Yeah. The last so, part first? Yeah, let's do a it. A lot of people f give their horse beer, and it's specifically Guinness beer. It's a popular the choice. Dark beer for this condition, and we should say anhydrosis is the um, complete or partial ability, loss of the ability to sweat in response to simulation. So when it gets hot and you think this horse should be sweating because I'm working him or it's just 100 degrees in the shade and he's not sweating, that's anhydrosis. Now some, pe some people would think like, oh, you don't sweat, that means you don't stink, that means you don't need deodorant, and they think it's a good thing. For horses, it's not a good thing. No. Can you tell us why? Yeah, and you know what? When I looked these up, because this one got to the top of the list very quickly. Very quick, like 3,000 votes quick. Yeah. This was a popular so one. So I, I knew right away I was going to have to answer this one. <laughs> I looked up the species that sweat, because not every species sweats, right? So elephants, bats, sloths, lemurs, beavers, primates. I can find no relationship between those yeah, animals. That's surprising. But the point of sweat, like you were saying, oh, is you it cools you off. Bat? That's worse than just a bat, is a sweaty, a sweaty bat. bat. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> it's not good at all. These are funny, funny lists. But it's, it's to cool you off. So it gets warm, your, your core body temperature gets warm, and then there are signals in your brain and throughout the body that release um, sweat from glands, and then the evaporation of that sweat, that liquid, is what cools your body off and ma maintains your temperature. So the species that don't do that have to pant, like mm -hmm. a dog, mm -hmm. or wallow in mud, like a pig. They have other ways to cool their core body temperature off. Deodorant's looking pretty good right about now. Yeah. You know, Reverse walking around panting. Wall or wallowing in the mud. Yeah. Some of us do anyway. So the medication, I, there's not a medication for this, because we don't really know why horses lose their ability to sweat. And it can happen any age, uh, breed, gender. There doesn't seem to be any sort of predilection or a predisposition. It does happen when a horse comes from a northern climate, say Massachusetts, where we are, to Florida, where it's hot and humid, and they suddenly lose their ability to sweat. So some of the advice is to um, allow your horse to acclimate to a new environment gradually. Make sure they're conditioned before you get there. If you're going to provide a supplement, not a medication for this condition, then you want to have it on board before they start getting those signals to sweat. And I don't normally mention a supplement, but there is one, it's called One AC, that has some really good research on it. It was done in Florida 
that in, it, it contains things like tyrosine, which is amino acid, some B vitamins, cobalt, niacin, and other things, and it has been shown to help horses sweat. Now, beer has not been shown through research to help horses sweat, but anecdotally, you hear about it. So I felt like I had to bring some today. Okay. But. Can you explain the difference? Because I think this is something, it's a subtlety that if you don't work at Smart Pack, I think a lot of people just don't think about. The difference between a medication and a supplement. Sure. So when we talk about a medication that's an FDA approved prescription medication that is approved for use in the species here, it's the horse. So there's been extensive research proving safety and efficacy millions of dollars, seven to 10 years, it's a big deal. So when you see a Prescend, a GastroGuard, something like that, that's got years and years and lots of dollars behind it. That's why we call them Big Pharma. Mm -hmm. So, All right, our next question is by Lyra and it was also submitted on YouTube. And Lyra's wondering, I have a question about the horse's teeth this time. Sounds like Lyra's asked some questions before. Good it for did, you. it did, yeah. Some people say it's needed to float the teeth once a year. Others say longer, others say more frequent. What is your opinion on floating and how do I know my horse needs her teeth floated? Okay, that, I thought that was a really, really uh, good question. The, if you notice, our Colicare annual wellness requirements, one of them is an annual dental exam. And you notice we word it as a dental exam because if you get your veterinarian in the mouth, and it's not just looking at the teeth, but it's looking at the lips and the gums and the tongue and the whole head in fact, that annual exam, hands-on and visual, then out of that comes a recommendation. Everything looks good, your horse has very good alignment, like you know how some people have a good bite? Mm -hmm. Some horses have a good bite. And even though the bottom teeth are narrower than the top teeth, and so you get outside sharp edges on the top teeth and inside sharp edges on the bottom teeth, and horses do have to be floated or rasped, rasped on a regular basis, um, some horses have such a good bite that they manage very well despite the diet we give them. So domesticated, contained, or confined horses, mm -hmm. um, they're not grazing on greedy grass all the time, and they don't wear their teeth down like a horse living out and grazing mm -hmm. all day would. So we do have to float, but let your veterinarian who is examining the mouth at least once a year tell you. The rule of thumb that I have is because there's so many changes going on in the mouth when they're losing their baby teeth up through about five, five and a half, six years of age, have the vet examine the mouth twice a year when they're babies. Then when they're in their, their mature adults and all their teeth are in their permanent teeth, from about five to 15, depending on how your horse is aging, may, maybe once a year, unless there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you know my horse has a bad bite and there's a tooth that overgrows, then that might still be a horse that a twice a year exam would be good. And then after they become a senior, could be 15, could be 17, 18, could be 20, I would go back to twice a year because you know, the horses teeth grow throughout their lives and as they grow the tooth becomes smaller and so there can be pockets or spaces between the teeth where they did fit tight now they fit loose and so they can have periodontal or gum disease and there can also be uneven wear and, and malocclusion as we call it uneven bite so then I would go back to twice a year but it really comes to examine and then decide what your course of action will be okay while we're on the subject of teeth, I just want to throw a suggestion out there. I would love to see a question get asked and voted on about how you can tell how old a horse is by his teeth. Oh. But I'm going to save that for you guys. <laughs> Somebody wants to submit that question. You that, know, I'm just saying, I would vote for it. That might have to have some uh, pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can get some good pictures with just the horses at Smart Pack. Maybe. Mike Cody's 28. Oh, he'd be he's, great. He's going to have some. He is what they say, long in the tooth. Real teeth in there. <laughs> Alrighty, so Haley on YouTube is asking, how can you tell if your farrier is doing a good job and what oh. does a healthy hoof look like? So I wasn't touching this one with a 10 foot pole, so I asked- Because you don't want to offend your farrier. Well, right, I love my farrier. That's right. So I asked our hoof health consultant, Danvers Child, to write something and he didn't want to touch it either. He was like, this is a loaded question, but he did because he's so wonderful. And well, and also because he didn't have to be here to read it. So right. he could say, like, I didn't write that. It's a little bit long, but it's I read it and it's really, really good. So just bear with me. Okay. Without actually learning the farrier trait, which takes years and years and years, 
you're kind of taking the leap of faith when evaluating the competency of a farrier. It's just like what you do when you select a mechanic, a doctor, a plumber, a lawyer, any specialty provider. However, what those professionals and tradesmen have that a farrier doesn't is a license. Mm -hmm. In North America, farriery is not regulated. So you have no assurances of baseline knowledge or skill. Nevertheless, he also has a PhD in English, so he uses big words like nevertheless. Many motivated farriers will have voluntarily submitted to testing through the American Farriers Association. To that end, when flying blind, it's a good idea to look for someone who has earned the AFA's Certified Farrier CF or Certified Journeyman Farrier CJF, which he has credential behind their name. Beyond that, here's the bullet points. You're looking for someone who pursues CE or continuing education, works well with the team. That's the vet, that's the horse owner, the trainer, there's a lot of people involved. Gets along with animals, especially horses. Understands options and helps you determine the best choices for your horse. Performs his or her work confidently, comfortably. Takes the time to work with you and your horse. Answers your questions honestly and adequately and doesn't make up answers. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then pays attention to your horse and alerts you to potential issues and problems. Most importantly, you're looking for someone who addresses the individual needs of your horse. This I love. As an apprentice, my mentor once told me that if I saw two horses that were shod exactly the same, at least one of them was shod wrong. So I like that. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Okay. So I hope that was helpful. I think that was helpful. And I think if you guys want more info, so that's on how you choose and how you evaluate the quality of the farrier, right. how you evaluate the quality of the hoof, Danvers has actually done an entirely separate video mm -hmm. for us. Um, so you can go and watch that video. We'll link to it in the description of this one. And when you check that one out, you can hear what his voice actually sounds like. <laughs> right. Because that's the accent that I keep trying to get Lydia to do. And she I'm won't do it. Do. She won't do it. But maybe you guys could suggest that in the comments. <laughs> it's still and then maybe do she'll it. do it. Yeah. <laughs> We can, we, can, we can make this happen. <laughs> okay, so Sydney, also on YouTube, you YouTubers, you guys are coming in with some good questions this time. Sydney on YouTube is wondering, with the show season coming up, is it truly harmful to shave or trim a horse's facial whiskers since they are, quote, connected to their brain cells? This one, I was kind of hoping wasn't going to get voted up because I don't want to offend anyone with an answer. This is why we don't give you the ability to downvote. Oh. <laughs> So there's parts of the question that are accurate and parts that are not accurate. So I think we'll start with there. Okay. Um, we know that horses have whiskers around their muzzle and around their, their eyes and they have hair in their ears. And many disciplines in the U.S., they like to, to trim or clip or even shave razor those mm -hmm. for show purposes. In fact, in Europe, it's, it's prohibited for show and also just to have a horse. Like their animal cruelty law mm. forbids it. So, and here's why. It's not that the whisker is directly attached to a brain cell and there be harm in cutting it. It's that horses and other animals use the whiskers to tell where they are. So they use them to approach their feed tub, their water, uh, hot wire. Um, it's very handy in the dark. Mm. It's, so it's, it's sort of an extra eye. It's a, it's a third eye. And when they can't see, this is very useful. They're they're monocular animals, not like us that are that are binocular. So mm -hmm. our depth perception is very very good. We also have um, a strands that pull our lens in our eye, tight and loose, and so we can focus back and forth. And you notice a horse when they see something scary, they're doing this with their head. That's because they have to move their lens up and down to see through it. Kind of like you're, if you're wearing glasses with bifocals, you have to find the right. Um, focusing distance to see clearly. So they're not as good at us at seeing fine close up. Mm. So they use their whiskers. Mm -hmm. And then if we cut them, we're a little bit making it harder for them to navigate their surroundings. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not harmful in the fact that you're going to do damage to the horse. It doesn't hurt. Unless, right, unless he bumps into something. I mean, if you cut the eye whiskers and then they bump into something with their really prominent eye, that could be a problem. Cody has a really prominent eye. And I, I thought of this, um, as a driving horse, I didn't know this, this is how inexperienced I was, but you've got blinkers on, right? Blinders or winkers or whatever you want to call them. And if the eye whisker is poking out and touching the blinker all the time, they're getting feedback all the time, like something is there. So my driving trainer was like, why don't you cut those? And so that I do 
to make it feel better for him, but then I leave the ones in the front. Mm. So I, th I think it comes down to personal preference and what your discipline is. And if you have a horse in a pasture not doing anything, by all means, leave him alone because that's hair is there. Even felt like hair is there for a reason. Um, and but then you have to do what you feel you need to do to go to the show ring. So, all right. Last but not least, rounding out the questions, all coming from YouTube this time, we have Marta who's wondering, I have an Appaloosa paint mix, and my farrier once mentioned to me to be careful about moon blindness. What is it? What breeds does it affect? And what can be done to prevent it? And once it's oh. contracted, what are the treatment options? Since my horse is a mix, is he less likely to contract moon blindness? There were like 12 questions there in were. there. Okay. So, all right, I'll try, all right. try to keep us on track. Um, so moon blindness is what maybe the lay person would call it. Um, a vet might use the term equine recurrent uveitis or even periodic ophthalmia. Um, and those words give it away. So equine recurrent means it comes and goes. It happens, it, it's, it's chronic. And then uveitis is inflammation or itis of the uvea. And the uvea is internal eye structures. So you might, it looks like um, a tearing eye, squinting, cloudy. Mm -hmm. the, even the white part is red. Um, that's how you notice it. So anytime you see that in your horse, that's an emergency. That's something you call your vet for. You do not put something in there mm -hmm. that you have from last year or two years ago because this treatment might, be, might include steroids. And in fact, they say aggressive anti-inflammatory agents, mm -hmm. the FDA approved medications. Um, if you put a steroid in an eye that is tearing and squinting and cloudy, but it's because of a corneal Scratch. ulcer, you're done, it's bad. So eyes are something you should always contact your vet about. Moon blindness, she does have an Appaloosa cross. There is a, they, what do they say, Appaloosas are overrepresented mm -hmm. when it comes to moon blindness. Mm -hmm. So there probably is a genetic component to this. It's an autoimmune disease. And what triggers it though? Like why do they get it? Because not every Appaloosa is right. gonna have this. Right. However, when an Appaloosa does get moon blindness, they tend to have those waxing and waning bouts of inflammation and eventually they can go blind from it. So prevention wise, we don't know what you can do to prevent it. Because there is, is a, probably an association with leptospirosis, a bacteria, things that reduce your horse's chances of getting infected with that, like removing standing water, would be helpful. But really, it's close observation of your horse. Use of a fly mask to protect the eye, both before they have this and then after, really, and also to keep the sun away from them um, is good. Treatment is like I said, the aggressive anti-inflammatories, both intravenous, um, orally, so you feed them right in the eye. Might be something like a atropine, which dilates the eye, which means your fly mask is really important because if their eye is artificially dilated, they can't close it to sun. You, it's painful then, the sun, so you need to put something that, that darkens it. Um, it's really, though, observation. And some of these horses, Historically, let's say, they will live on something like aspirin, so it's a mild anti-inflammatory because sometimes you can't see even the um, inflammation, it's, but it's happening. And every time there's a bout of inflammation in the eye, it worsens and worsens and worsens, which is what leads to blindness. blindness. It builds up and builds up over time, and then you have a problem. These horses sometimes, and this is gonna sound terrible, but the eye is so painful that they will take it out. Mm. It's called enucleation. It's a pretty straightforward operation, um, but then you have a, a one-eyed horse, and so it doesn't look great, and then you have to worry about him getting around. So it really makes sense to try and prevent this or watch for those bouts and, and manage them as best you can. Have you ever known in your barn a one-eyed horse? Yeah. Yeah, they're very sweet, like they're very trusting. They, I feel and they like they actually often, do quite well. Yeah, they relate to people really yeah. well, and they like to have the socket itched. And they tend to have noticed. a buddy horse. Yeah, there is usually another animal. Yeah. sometimes a horse, sometimes something else that takes care of them. Yeah, which is really sweet. Yeah. 
All right, so that is all of our questions for this time around. Thank you guys, as always, for submitting the questions. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, emailing customer care at smartpack.com, commenting on the blog. Those are all places that you guys can beat these YouTubers if you want to get your questions <laughs> selected next time. And of course, everybody who's watching on YouTube, you can ask right here in the comments. Don't forget to use hashtag AskTheVetVideo so we can make sure to keep track of all the right. questions. We'll be selecting questions next time until May 11th. And when we have all the questions, we'll gather them up. You can vote on Twitter, our blog, and on YouTube. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, as the record always. is 3,000. I know. <laughs> this, this is going to be tough to beat. But you oh. can get as many people as you want. To re you can recruit your friends. You can recruit your family. You can start a pets? campaign in your barn. Because pets, probably. I mean, especially like it feel like a, like a bird. Would oh, probably be able to vote yeah, very well. Yeah. I think it's probably, or maybe a sweaty bat. A sweaty bat. Yeah, maybe you make it work so hard on the voting that it just starts sweating, sweaty bat. and that is probably a nightmare I'll yeah. have later. Uh, so that's all we have for this time. Please subscribe so that you don't miss our next video and you don't miss the video to vote for the questions so right. that you can get three thousand and one. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and have a great ride.